Lecture number 13, Stoichiometry, part 2. <clears throat> so the last time we, we started making that connection between those atoms and molecules and masses in, within the chemical reaction. So in this case, we're just going to take that a step further. We're still, so we're still talking about the stoichiometry. And we can relate atoms or molecules, if anything, within that sort of balanced chemical equation through this idea of moles. So if we can figure out how many moles of a species we have, we can then convert to any other species based on that molar ratio from the balanced chemical equation. Right? And from if we get to moles, then we can go to anything. We can go to mass in grams from the molar mass. We can go to the number of atoms or molecules from Avogadro's number. Um, and then that relationship of molecules and atoms to molecules. <clears throat> so we're just going to take that one step further now. Um, in the, the last video, we talked about taking a single reactant and predicting products, or a single product and predicting reactant, reactants. But now we're, we don't do reactions just based on one thing. There's always two, at least two things reacting typically. So if we, we can, we're going to start with a certain mass and it's going to dictate what happens. So if we look at that then, take this uh, hypothetical situation where we take, react yellow dots with blue dots. Right? <clears throat> if we have a balanced reaction where we have, it takes two blue dots for every one yellow dot to form this uh, complex, right? we can look at this reaction vessel, this reaction, and predict how many products we're going to get. Right? If we just look at the blue dots, we would say we have eight blue dots. Each reaction takes two of those, and we have six yellow dots. Each reaction takes two blue dots, so we ha can form four of the complexes based on the number of blue dots we have. If we look at the number of yellow dots we have, we can only we can form six of those, right, based on the numbers that required to make the complex. Right. So, <clears throat> which are we going to make? Right. Are we going to make four? Or are we going to make six? Right. We're going to see that we can only make four because the blue dots are going to run out after we've made four. So that those blue dots then are going to be what we call the limiting reagent. It's the one that's going to determine how much of the products we're going to be able to form. And it's the one that runs out first. Where the yellow dots in this case are going to be what we call the excess reagent, the one that we have extra of. So it's going to, some of it's going to be remaining at the end. <clears throat> so for now, we're just going to add that into our calculations. We're, if we start with two amounts of reactants, we're going to figure out which one runs out first or which is the limiting reagent. <clears throat> and while that sounds complicated, what we're going to do is actually just solve the problem twice. And then, just like in this case, we're going to choose the smaller number right, if we're looking for the mass of the product. <clears throat> so let's look at an example. So let's say we have a reaction of two sodium hydroxide plus carbon dioxide forms sodium carbonate and water. How many moles of the sodium carbonate can be formed or produced when 1.8 moles of sodium hydroxide and one mole of carbon dioxide are allowed to react? Right? So to answer this question, we're just going to take those individually. We're going to look at, okay, if we converted all the 1.85 moles of sodium hydroxide to sodium carbonate, how much it would we form? And then if we converted all of that one mole of carbon dioxide to sodium carbonate, how much of that would we form? Right? So mathematically, we're going to go through that molar ratio. So 1.85 moles of sodium hydroxide. We'll get one mole of sodium carbonate for every two moles of sodium hydroxide that react. So we'd be, we'd be forming, in theory, this 0.925 moles of sodium carbonate. Or if we look solely at the carbon dioxide, take the one mole of carbon dioxide, we would get one mole of sodium carbonate for every one mole react, again from the balanced reaction. So we could potentially or theoretically form one mole. One of those is we can only form this smaller amount, so the actual amount that we're going to form of sodium carbonate is that smaller amount, so the 0.925 moles. So that's our answer. So we're going to attempt these problems just like we have before, going from mass to moles, moles of one to moles of another, and then if necessary back to mass. But we're just going to do that twice for each one, treating each individually, and then we're going to select the smallest one. That's going to be the amount that's actually formed. 
Right? So let's take another look at another one a little bit more involved. So if we look at in the process, 124 grams of aluminum are reacted with 601 grams of iron oxide <clears throat> through this balanced chemical equation. We want to calculate the mass of that aluminum oxide that is formed. So we're going to look again, we can convert all of that 124 grams of aluminum to aluminum oxide, and then the 601 grams of iron oxide to aluminum oxide, doing those stoichiometric steps we had before. We're going to take that 124 grams of aluminum, convert to moles by dividing by the molar mass, use the molar ratio from the balanced chemical equation, and then convert to mass, again, using the molar mass of the aluminum oxide. So in that case, we would get 234.30 grams of aluminum oxide from the aluminum. Or, if we looked at just the iron, we take that 601 grams, divide by the molar mass again, the molar ratio of 1 to 1 in this case for the iron and oxide versus aluminum oxide. Again, multiplying by the molar mass of aluminum oxide, we would, could form 383.71 grams. So we have two possible answers. If we consumed all of the iron oxide, we would get 383. If we consumed all of the aluminum, we would get 234. So again, since we can only form the smaller amount, the amount that's going to be formed is that 234 grams. <clears throat> so these numbers that we're predicting using this sort of limiting reagent calculation are what we call a theoretical yield. It's the amounts of product that would result from the limiting reaction. It's, it's a theoretical, if all of it was consumed, that's the number we would get. <clears throat> if we actually go into the laboratory and do this reaction, we will actually produce some amount. Right? That's what we're going to call the actual yield. Right? So it's the amount of product actually obtained from the reaction. <clears throat> so then we can talk about the percent yield, which is just the relationship between those. The percent yield is the actual yield divided by that theoretical yield times 100. Okay. So let's go back to that previous example where we formed aluminum uh, oxide. So if in that reaction we only formed 217 grams of aluminum oxide, what is its percent yield? Again, we're going to take the actual yield divided by the theoretical times 100. So the actual we're saying here was 217. The theoretical we calculated just a minute ago was 234. So 217 divided by 234 times 100 is going to give us a percent yield of 92.7%. It's a pretty good yield. Right? <clears throat> so now we can not just talk about simple reactions where we're taking a single or a single complex compound and reacting it to look at products or the relationship between those, but we can now look at the entire chemical reaction and see if we have both reactants present how much are we going to form it? What's our theoretical amount going to be, that theoretical yield, based on this idea of a limiting reagent? Right? But not only that, but we can then go back and figure out how much, if we wanted, the excess re reagent that is remaining, <clears throat> the amount that's left over of that product, of that reactant that's in the bigger amount. We can do that calculation just by figuring out how much isn't formed and working backwards. So now we can sort of go back to that initial diagram, we can move across all species in this chemical balance chemical reaction and relate the amounts that are actually going to be there at both the beginning of the reaction and at the end. I don't get it!